We really appreciate you joining us for day four of the World Bank's Fragility Forum. Thank you so much for being with us for this morning's session. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about addressing compound risks and increasing resilience in the FCB context. Um, we all know that fragile countries are especially vulnerable to shocks. Um, no better example of that than the last two years with what we've all seen with the COVID pandemic. But obviously, we also have climate change and food crises and natural disasters and economic crises, forced displacement. Um, of course, we're, we're seeing that very acutely in the last uh, two weeks as well. Um, and as I said, COVID, you know, really stark reminder of how complex crises and interconnected risks can, can amplify challenges in FCB contexts. And in those settings, shocks obviously tend to be more pronounced. People in fragile situations feel shocks more acutely and are, are more vulnerable to such things. And with so many shocks happening in our world at the same time, FCB countries can struggle to respond to these and their vulnerability to future shocks is also really increased and, and makes them more vulnerable in the long term as well. So um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about what, what countries can do um, to, to strengthen their crisis preparedness and resilience in FCB contexts. That can be really challenging to think about resiliency when um, every day-to-day -day situation is, is so grave and people are concerned about meeting their most basic needs. And perhaps we're talking about situations where uh, the government is not in a position to really be helping citizens build resiliency to multiple shocks. Um, so uh, today we're going to be talking about the the short term, but as well as the longer term view and how how countries might go about building political, economic, social investments that are going to consolidate and protect future development gains, even when we are experiencing so many shocks in our world today. So I am so delighted to be joined today by four very distinguished panelists. I so will introduce them briefly, and then uh, we will dive right into our our conversation. We have joining us today um, is Michelle Pierre-Louis, who is the former Prime Minister of Haiti. We have Joyce Msuya, who is the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs at UNOCHA. Antoinette Saya, who is the Deputy Managing Director at the IMF. And finally, Axel von Trotzenberg, the Managing Director of Operations at the World Bank. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, we are going to move uh, to Ms. Uh, Pierre-Louis first. I'm going to mention at the top here, unfortunately, she's not able to be with us for the whole session. So um, she's got uh, quite a busy schedule today. We really appreciate her time this morning. So I um, am going to direct the first two questions directly to her while she's able to be with us, and then we will move on to additional panelists. Uh, Ms. Pierre-Louis, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, you're the former president Minister of Haiti. And obviously, so much happening in that country right now. I was last in Haiti in October and had a really incredible experience and really, really impactful time. Um, I do a lot of reporting specifically on agriculture, nutrition, and the food system. And so my reporting was looking at um, how all of the fragility and compound uh, uh, crises in Haiti affects people's access to food in the agriculture system and the way that people are able to access food. So um, really, really, really impactful trip that, that I was able to take. So I really am so pleased that you are with us this morning. And I wanted to ask you first um, what we can learn from the situation in Haiti and, um, you know, seeking to reduce the risk of future conflicts um, future complex crises in FCB uh, contexts like Haiti. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm going to speak in French because it's easier for me. Donc, je remercie d'abord la Banque mondiale de m'avoir invité à ce panel euh, sur euh, la fragilité, les conflits et la violence. Et, mais je dirais par rapport à la question qui m'est posée qu'il ne s'agit pas de risque futur, nous sommes déjà dans le conflit. Et c'est vraiment euh, un défi extrêmement important pour nous, pour le développement futur d'Haïti certainement, mais pour l'actualité telle que nous la vivons aujourd'hui dans notre pays. Donc c'est vrai que Haïti est un pays 
extrêmement fragile du point de vue de la construction de, de ces institutions. Depuis la chute de la dictature, il y a plus de 30 ans, ça a été extrêmement difficile pour nous d'arriver à construire des institutions qui puissent durer, qui puissent assurer des services publics, qui puissent répondre aux, aux demandes des citoyens et des citoyennes. Et même toutes les missions de l'ONU que nous avons eues au cours des 15 dernières années n'ont pas réussi à consolider les institutions de ce pays. Donc la fragilité institutionnelle est un handicap sérieux et pour avoir été Premier ministre, je peux vous dire que même quand on fait des efforts pour construire ces institutions et avec l'aide de, 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 des institutions internationales, mais les institutions internationales ont leur propre paradigme et des fois on a l'impression de l'intérieur que ce paradigme est un peu obsolète et épuisé par rapport aux exigences et par rapport aux demandes de, de la construction des institutions et des populations. Donc, c'est vrai aussi que cette fragilité est encore plus grave aujourd'hui, depuis les derniers événements politiques. Hein, et nous vivons dans une période hors, constitu hors constitution, hors loi, et même l'actuel gouvernement, le gouvernement a été construit un petit peu hors normes. Donc, ce qui ne favorise pas nécessairement ni la construction des institutions, ni même envisager des élections qui pourraient, dans la situation actuelle, et je viens au deuxième, au deuxième aspect, et qui pourraient réassurer une certaine stabilité. Donc, on est dans une extrême fragilité institutionnelle, constitutionnelle, légale, et naturellement avec toutes les implications sociales qui viennent avec cette situation d'extrême fragilité. Maintenant, à cause des conflits actuels qui sont politiques, mais qui ont des, des implications sociales extrêmement fortes, parce que toutes les mesures que nous avons de, de ce qui est arrivé récemment montrent que la pauvreté augmente, et euh, la population a, est en train de migrer largement, n'ayant pas de moyens de voir comment se projeter dans l'avenir du pays. Nous perdons énormément de compétences et en plus, Haïti a été vu aussi comme le, euh, le marché du travail dans la Caraïbe et peut-être aux États-Unis et dans le monde. Donc, il y a une forte migration de gens qui n'ont pas nécessairement de compétences et qui vont aller euh, compliquer les situations dans les lieux où ils migrent. Donc, l'actuel conflit est énormément est grave, extrêmement grave, et nous n'en voyons pas encore la fin. D'autant qu'il est lié à la violence actuelle. Nous ne fabriquons pas d'armes, nous ne produisons pas d'armes, nous avons un flux continu d'armes qui viennent des États-Unis principalement et qui ont gangréné la société haïtienne avec des kidnappings qui se font tous les jours, personne n'est exempt et on est en train de ruiner des familles sans qu'il n'y ait aucune volonté politique de régler cette question-là. Nous vivons, moi je vis en Haïti, et je peux vous dire que chaque jour, je sors de chez moi et je ne sais pas si je vais rentrer dans l'après-midi. Donc, euh, c'est une situation gravissime et c'est vrai que les Haïtiens ont une responsabilité, mais toute l'international toute a également son porteur aussi de cette responsabilité. Parce que nous n'avons pas eu nécessairement, et c'est pour ça que je dis que le paradigme il faut, il, faut, il faut changer de paradigme aujourd'hui pour appuyer des, des pays comme Haïti qui, que la Banque mondiale elle-même désigne le pays le plus pauvre de ce Avec ça, que j'ai toujours été un peu contre cette désignation. C'est vrai que, vous savez, c'est vrai que quand on regarde les indicateurs, le PIB, etc., la pauvreté en Haïti, elle est réelle. Qu'est-ce qu'on a fait pour sortir de cette pauvreté? Qu'est-ce qu'on a fait aussi si on changeait les indicateurs? 
et qu'on regardait la l'énergie, la créativité, la résilience, la résistance de ce peuple, je crois que on, on, on serait bien plus haut dans les classements et tout en ayant une volonté de lutter contre la situation extrême des populations marginalisées dans ce pays. Donc, je reviendrai sur la, le deuxième aspect de la question parce que je pense qu'il y a des choses que l'on peut faire. Moi, je dis, je suis président d'une fondation que j'ai créée il y a 27 ans et nous arrivons à faire énormément de choses. Madame, vous avez dit que vous, vous étiez en Haïti et que vous avez vu ce qui se passe dans les petites exploitations familiales marchandes de ce pays qui produisent la nourriture, je crois qu'elle a été marginalisée, elles ont été marginalisées. Et aujourd'hui, on ne peut pas penser sortir de cette situation sans un accompagnement de proximité des millions de paysans et de paysans haïtiennes qui continuent de produire de la nourriture dans, et, qui, et, et pour lesquelles il n'existe aucune médiation, sauf certaines institutions comme celle que je dirige en Haïti. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's so impactful to hear you say, you know, I leave my house every day and I don't know if I'm coming back. I mean, that's the most basic element of citizen security, right? If that is the environment in which people are living, how how can you be expected to uh, think about the future, you know, to to succeed, to to build a country when everyone walking around the street has that fear every single day. That's, you know, I think such a perfect demonstration of really the, the complexity of, of course, the situation in Haiti, but in other um, FCB contexts as well around the world. And it also really struck me. Let, that you let said, me give you an example. Let me give you an example, if I may, rapidly. Yeah. No, when I was a prime minister in Haiti is the chief of the CSPN, which is the higher council for the police. And on the, in, on, on the legal paper, we're supposed to meet four times a year. I used to meet every week. And when I took office, I asked the chief of police, how many kidnappings were there the year before I, was, I took office? At the time, there were very few kidnappings. And he said, maybe 100, 200. I said, we're going to deal with this issue rapidly. And the, the, the year I took office, I took office in September. December, usually a peak time in kidnapping. And that year, because of that chief police and that, I, that I gave all the means to reduce and to, to, to really deal with this issue, we had practically no kidnapping. And during the time I was in office, there were no kidnappings. <laughs> so it's not an issue that cannot be dealt with. Right. At the time, there were not that many gangs either. You see what I mean? Today, the flow of, of arms that get that gets into that small part of the island is unbelievable. It's mind blowing, and the police doesn't even have the arms that the gangs have. So, how are we going to deal with that alone? With a police that is mistreated by the administration, and you know they only pay lip service to getting. And, and everybody lives in fear. You know, my grandson goes to school every day and every day I'm scared because the area where his school is, they're kidnapping people every day. So how, how can we build security? How can we get out of this nonsense if we don't deal with that particular issue and we think we can have elections in that issue? It's impossible. Right, right. and then it's sort of where where does the circle end, right? If you just keep sort of going around, you can't hold elections because it's too insecure and the insecurity is not going to get better because there's no political will and the police don't have the resources and then you're just, you're you're trapped. And obviously that's, um, you know, very challenging to live and really heartbreaking to watch in a country like Haiti that has, you know, so much potential. And another thing that you said that really struck me was, um, you know, how much international involvement there has been in Haiti, um, particularly since the 2010 earthquake. And unfortunately, those billions and billions and billions of dollars 
haven't done anything to solve these problems. I would love to hear from you what the international community needs to be doing to, to, to get Haiti out of this loop and really to be building the resiliency that's going to allow the country to move forward and be successful economically and really allow citizens to live secure, prosperous, safe lives. You know, when, when I was in government, and I cannot say how, how it is today, but that's 10 years ago, uh, when we had an accord with the IMF, it was, it was very important for Haiti. Uh, when I was in, in office, the Minister of Finance signed an accord with the IMF, and there are conditionalities. And sometimes the conditionalities are not easy to meet. Uh, but the accord is important because the IMF somehow, no matter what one may think, gives the green light to all the other donors. So it's very important to understand that when we have an accord, is that, does that accord meet the, you know, what it takes to re, re, reinforce our, our, our institutions? And sometimes it's difficult, but at the same time, when you really want, when you're thinking about the country, the development of the country, when you're thinking about the people of Haiti, you can make the effort to meet the conditionalities. It's not easy. For instance, when I was in office, we had the EPIC project, the Paypov Très Andeti. And there were several conditionalities to alleviate the debt of Haiti. And we met them. And in June 2009, and the IMF person is here and can confirm that, we had one over $1 billion of debt that were alleviated because we had met the conditionalities of all the donors. And our minister went to the Club de Paris to sign that they were going to erase $1.2 or $3 billion of debt of Haiti. But at the same time, to come back to your question, I think it's very important for those who negotiate with us to have a better understanding of what is at stake in Haiti. You know, we have a capacity to produce. We have some niche production. You know, every year, the demand for cocoa in Haiti is 25,000 pounds. We can hardly export 5,000. And there, is, there, is, there are cooperatives that work very hard for, 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 to meet this demand, and they need support. Same with coffee. Haitian coffee and cocoa are used worldwide to, I'll say it in French, to aromatize les autres espèces because of the quality of our, our why, why can't there be programs that help those small enterprise, you know, to, to produce more, to act, you know, I, we support a small, uh, a small enterprise that is in Coco. They, they go to Costa Rica to have their lab, to, to, to go to the lab. Why can't we help them to have a, a good lab so that they can, you, rather than, than traveling to, 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 to a, 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 a foreign lab, have their own lab and things like that, you know? So there is a need to know what's going on in the country. Where are the actors that, are re, that can really make change and that need support to, to, to reach the transformation that we're expecting in that country? And production is key. Jobs are key. You know, people are leaving the country because there is no job. Then they're also leaving because of insecurity. But they're also leaving the country because there are no jobs. You know, there are three agricultural campaigns in that country. The largest one is, is now. And when, they, when the campaign is at its most, there are over 3 million people involved in that campaign. Why are they why are they still poor? 
why can't we understand the value chains of, of the products they are they are working on and help them from the seed to the market? Why can't we? It's not difficult. And that would be a change maker in the country. Yeah, those are such I'm passionate. I'm points. sorry, I'm very passionate about my country. Yeah. <laughs> no, we love to see that. We love to see folks passionate. Um, yeah, I've been in the Central Plateau in Haiti and you know, visited with farmers and been in their fields. And that's such a major issue is people just don't feel like they have access to markets. And as you mentioned, that whole value chain can be such a struggle because you know it is about the technical assistance and the quality of seeds that farmers have available in the field, but it's also about about their ability to get those products to local markets, you know, to sell in their communities to their neighbors, but also to the ports to maybe be exported. But if you don't have basic security, if you don't have basic infrastructure, if the roads are constantly blocked, if there's no gas, you can't do any of that. And, you know, farmers are obviously- And now they are the gangs. And now they are the gangs. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So yeah, just such a such a complex set of issues. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're gonna. You need to work also on the mediations. Who can be the intermedia- intermediaries between this international community and all these local organizations? You know, there are there are some NGOs, there are some institutions that can be that work in a proximity with these, uh, with these stakeholders and can be very good intermediaries, capable of accounting for whatever financial support they get. They have the capacity to do that, but they are totally ignored by the international community. And sometimes the international community, by ignoring them, go to support corrupt government knowing very well that the government is corrupt. You mentioned the the billions that came after after the earthquake. What happened? I mean, we are are in a worse situation now and we're still having earthquakes and hurricanes and we are never able to mitigate this, this, this on our own. I mean, this is incredible. We cannot continue like this. And this will be my final word because my, unfortunately, as I told you, I'm in Puerto Rico and I have to leave because I have an unexpected situation I have to deal with. Uh, uh, once again, thank you very much for having invited me. I'm sorry I couldn't, I cannot stay more because there is so much more to be said about Haiti. And um, But I wish you the very best and I'm sorry I cannot hear the other panelists because I'm sure I would be able to learn from them. And uh, I, I uh, please... Uh, Je vous souhaite une bonne continuation. Merci de m'avoir invité. Et encore une fois, je reste à votre disposition si jamais je peux encore participer dans un autre panel. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being with us. Um, it was it was great to sort of have that scene setter for the rest of our conversation focusing on Haiti. Um, we're going to bring in our other panelists now. Thanks to the three of you for being with us as well. Uh, we're going to move to Axel now and um, talk a little bit more about what governments can do. Um, so, so Axel, from you, I'd love to hear what, from the, the perspective, what governments can do to better prepare when they're responding to multiple and overlapping threats in FCB contexts. So thank you and good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. Um, and it's, uh, it's really uh, difficult to answer this question because uh, one of the big challenges countries are facing is what I would say the cumulative challenge. It is not COVID, it's, it's not the only crisis. It's a health crisis in general, natural disasters, economic crisis, vote insecurity, and then unfortunately, uh, uh, the political crises that are often degenerated sometimes in fighting. And if that is not enough, you have the climate crisis. So I would say this is the cumulative things and, and some this is overwhelming. Why is it overwhelming? Not because policy uh, makers cannot take decisions, but because the issues are such that they have limited resources, limited capabilities, and so that makes the decisions uh, also so difficult. And so one of the areas where we need to look is, is certainly in times of crisis, how you prioritize 
and how you are facing trade-off decisions. And that is difficult, but I think here one can also uh, rely on also on advice from the international community, how we can best help. But most importantly for the institutions and for countries that are confronted with it, is to take a step back and say, what will matter in the years ahead? And this means you need to think of the institutions, the institution building, because you need to build the capabilities. I can solve a problem maybe for a week, but these are not weekly problems. These are long-term problems. So what it is, is we will need to force a little bit more on the long-term uh, thinking, as well as that will require consensus building. That with all the differences people have in the societies, I hope that for, particularly, for example, with COVID you, or with some of the natural disasters, you can build a consensus. And there is some good news. Look what you can do in, for example, natural disasters and how preparedness has improved. You look a generation ago in countries like Bangladesh, when you had there a cyclone, it would kill annually tens of thousands of people. It doesn't happen anymore because there is a better preparation uh, uh, in place. So I think there are good, and even for low-income countries, there are these possibilities. So I think it is not all negative. It can be done. But what it is also important is that we have right now, and that is a big challenge for the World Bank and for all our aid agencies, is, is ultimately that all these crises get you into a kind of short-term logic. Everything is short-term. Well, in fact, there are the long-term challenges. And I think COVID has again highlighted this. We can provide all this support, but we cannot forget the longer-term agenda. Look, how many people have had the SDGs in their mouths in the last months. Think of yourself, how often did you were, uh, mention the word SDG and poverty reduction? Very few. But we cannot forget on this. So that is one of the things where we are trying to hammer on is that we, we shall not forget on the longer term challenges and that we need to do together. What means that it, it, it doesn't mean for the role of the bank? Clearly, we need to uh, 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 fight the crisis. We have done search. Uh, everybody is trying to do their best. But what we need to do is crisis then now, certainly prevention and preparedness, easier said than done, but in many areas you can do, and then fostering a longer-term agenda. What is equally important, please don't equate fragility with a, only a low-income country thing. Yes, there were things that are happening in the Sahel zone. Yes, there are things happening in the Horn of Africa. And what is in happening in Afghanistan is terrible. But what we now also see with Ukraine is that we should say it is not limited to low-income countries. And it's the harsh reality that also middle-income countries are affected. And, and, and you see it also in Venezuela where basically people are not talking. But if you are looking at the refugee streams, what is happening from Venezuela, this is about close to 6 million people. So one of the things is we should also get that also middle-income cars are, are, are affected. For us, for the multilaterals, this is a unique uh, uh, opportunity to uh, increase our relevance. By working together, whether that is in the UN system or in the multilateral development bank or with, with the IMF, it is not about uh, who is better or not. It is about complementarity. How can you put those and that, that works in? I often think, and I, I speak often with uh, Antoinette, I personally think that, for example, to help countries in the Sahel zone, the World Bank has increased its resources, but it is helpful to have also a complement on stable macro framework that you can count on not for a year program, but for, quite frankly, years, if not 10 years. And it is not on the conditionality for the IMF. No, it is providing a complementary role so that we can actually be successful together. So that is the one. The last child that I didn't talk much is, is clearly. Uh, is that climate 
is while we are focused on COVID, while we are focused on now the military conflict, uh, uh, war in, in, in Ukraine, we should not forget that actually climate can also change the world to the worst and particularly the poorest countries. So that is the other one where we desperately leave the longer term investments. So I think, I think we, uh, there, the, the, the challenges are clear. I think what we need to do is to offer also all those countries have acted a partnership, not limited to a year or two, but to a generation of sustained support. Back to you. Thanks so much, Axel. So many great points there. Um, I think you really hit at the crux of this in, you know, thinking about how this really has to be a long-term view. It's so hard, as we were talking about with Haiti, when you're in it every day, it feels like a crisis. It's really hard to get out of the loop, right? But th then you're not doing any long-term planning. You're not building for the future. And then you you stay where you are and you're not able to break out of, of that fragility cycle. Um, I think that's such a, a key point. And, you know, the, the question really that, um, you know, the, the solution that we need is how do you do that, right? How do you, when you have, um, you know, different fragile contexts, you mentioned, obviously, we have such a range of them from, you know, Afghanistan to now Ukraine, Venezuela, um, you know, obviously different in every context, but how, how do you make that happen in, in those countries um, when you have such a, a compound set of crises? And as you mentioned, when the world's attention is, you know, distracted, it sort of felt like we were at this moment where it felt like we were got to a place where we were going to be living with COVID and, you know, we have the, the means in place to, you know, carry on a certain amount of our lives regularly. And now, of course, we're all, uh, you know, captivated and horrified by what's happening in Ukraine. And so it just sort of feels like global attention too can't get to the place where, where we're able to, um, to think long-term. So yeah, I think that's, um, that's such a key point. Um, Antoinette, I'd love to come to you next and talk a little bit more about the, the fiscal perspective. Axel obviously alluded to this a bit as well. Um, but how can countries that are in um, FCB context better prepare for and manage the effects of compound risks from a fiscal perspective, you know, particularly with, I think, of, as we've seen with COVID, you, you know, you get into a cycle of crisis and you have your entire population being plunged into the same situation and really, really constrained fiscal space when you see economies basically completely shut down all across the world. How do you manage that compound risk all at once? You know, uh, thank you very much, uh, Teresa. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Really uh, thrilled to, to join this uh, very important conversation. Uh, a very timely one, uh, clearly in light of uh, uh, developments on, on the global uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks in particular. And, uh, you know, the confluence of shocks uh, that we continue to witness in uh, countries, all countries, but uh, especially uh, fragile and conflict affected countries. Uh, continue to face uh, multiple shocks all at once, uh, aggravating uh, each other. And uh, as Axel was uh, explaining, of course, uh, making it even more challenging, the trade-offs that uh, policymakers have to, have to uh, make uh, and to recognize in, 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 in responding to these shocks. So let me, let me start maybe by, by saying, of course, what is, I think, now obvious to all of us, but is that a macroeconomic and financial instability, of course, can be triggered by non-economic factors. We are witnessing that from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're starkly reminded now of the, the damage that conflict can, can cause. The reverse is also true. Uh, uh, clearly, economic vulnerabilities, economic instability uh, can exacerbate the effect of health, climate, or fragility-related shocks uh, by eroding policy space, uh, a limited policy space already that uh, uh, countries have, especially uh, fragile states, and also uh, uh, eroding uh, the capacity of institutions to, to really uh, address them. And uh, these interdependencies uh, or uh, compounding risk, as we may uh, otherwise uh, call them, can feed off each other, making for uh, even more deep and lasting damage. And uh, the capacity, the spillovers, of course, for regional and, uh, and global economies as well. So we really need to 
and a focus on supporting um, our member countries, countries, uh, e economies, but especially uh, fragile and conflict affected countries to build resilience uh, for future crises uh, that, that may uh, arise uh, uh, at once. And so maybe three, three things to, uh, to, to speak to in that context. Um, uh, turning uh, first, uh, of course, um, uh, countries need to increase their predictive capacity and preparedness. Uh, FCS countries uh, uh, need to be better uh, uh, positioned to actually uh, recognize uh, what may be coming down the road, uh, how to uh, 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 position themselves to deal with them. Uh, when compounding risks materialize, of course, spending needs rise uh, rapidly. And uh, at the same time, governments can face difficulties in raising extra revenues. We've seen that in the, in the pandemic, of course, and uh, resulting in pushing debt levels higher, which is the scenario we're seeing today in many countries. Um, and, um, you know, the, the dynamic uh, of all of this increases the trade-offs uh, for governments uh, that are especially sharp in, uh, in FCS context, uh, making effective fiscal uh, responses even more challenging. Uh, so to manage uh, fiscal pressures, uh, I think uh, we, we really need to support policymakers to improve their capacity to anticipate shocks and uh, to build uh, fiscal buffers when circumstances allow. And Axel was speaking to the issue of prioritization. And in the FCS context in particular, uh, given the, the, the severely constrained resources, uh, prioritization uh, of, of spending is, is even more critical. And um, so it, it, all of those uh, efforts, of course, uh, to, uh, to help uh, uh, countries uh, prevent uh, 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 crises when they can, but uh, uh, be prepared to respond uh, when they do erupt. Uh, I think the second uh, issue I'd like to speak to is the, uh, uh, the role of the fund in supporting countries in this endeavor. And um, I think our policy advice, certainly in capacity development, uh, on fiscal issues uh, can certainly uh, provide support. Uh, FCS face multiple institutional and policy bottlenecks uh, that limit their ability to use a fiscal policy effectively to manage crises. Um, our research, uh, of course, uh, shows that uh, FCS uh, tend to have uh, low tax capacity. Uh, you know, uh, their tax GDP ratios uh, 14 percent on average compared to, say, 18 uh, percent uh, in non-FCS countries uh, before the pandemic. And uh, they rely, have, uh, FCS, of course, rely heavily on uh, revenues from commodity exports, many of them, uh, and for, on import duties, a narrow, narrow uh, uh, revenue base. Uh, their economies certainly exhibit weak uh, tax and customs administrations, low co uh, compliance levels, uh, all of those uh, making for uh, very, very uh, challenged circumstances. And of course, uh, public expenditures uh, um, in many FCS primarily spent on wages, uh, on security uh, as well, and uh, much less on um, infrastructure and other underpinnings for uh, more uh, for development and um, uh, less able to also uh, respond to uh, pressures by uh, providing uh, uh, support through safety nets. Uh, so here the funds capacity development efforts can play an important role to assist institution building, uh, helping countries uh, with fiscal frameworks, uh, improving tax capacity by enhancing ta design, tax uh, uh, policy design, of course, uh, legal frameworks as well, uh, strengthening uh, of course, uh, uh, the PFM systems, which uh, is, a, is, a, is a big challenge in, in many FCS. Uh, so uh, those are some of the things that I think that on our part we can help with. The third point I wanted to speak to uh, before uh, concluding is that uh, as, uh, as um, uh, 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 the former prime minister uh, so uh, uh, ardently spoke to, of course, uh, political economy dynamics in FCS make uh, sustainable institution building quite difficult. Um, and uh, the fiscal challenges in these countries are intricately linked uh, to uh, individual countries' drivers of fragility. Uh, those are some of the lessons we've taken away from our, our engagement with FCS. And uh, we are just um, uh, coming out of, uh, just yesterday, actually, 
the approval uh, of our board of uh, uh, a new strategy uh, to, uh, to, to increase the, the, the effectiveness of our engagement. Um, and it is, it is clear that we need to better understand uh, the drivers of, of fragility in individual countries. So, for example, a rise in food, price, uh, food and oil prices in, in the absence of access to basic services in, in uh, particular FCS will certainly um, be strong predictors for social unrest. And we, we need to be uh, cognizant of that. But uh, on the other hand, I mean, countries' actions and commitments to improve governance, uh, to strengthen tr transparency of public spending, to... Uh, uh, to tackle elite capture also are often really game changers in increasing the effectiveness of institutions. And, and that also uh, uh, needs to be uh, uh, promoted and recognized. So at the fund, we are certainly uh, increasingly conscious of the need to more uh, fully understand these drivers of, of, uh, of instability and uh, fragility in individual countries. And, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're really working uh, to, to better uh, uh, calibrate our policy advice uh, uh, to uh, uh, boost uh, inclusiveness and to, to, to promote inclusiveness. On the fiscal front, uh, that will uh, require tailoring, tailoring uh, social spending policies, uh, uh, as well as, uh, you know, taking account the distributional impact of tax policy reforms that the countries uh, need to move forward. And of course, the dialogue, and again, uh, uh, coming back to the former prime minister and what she was also underscoring, the dialogue with civil society, with labor unions, with other uh, uh, key uh, uh, stakeholders in individual countries can be very, very impactful in helping us understand how these issues uh, converge. So uh, we've uh, also stepped up the big uh, 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 part of uh, 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 efforts to, to really get at the, the, the drivers of fragility in a number of countries as well. Uh, climate, uh, and Axel spoke to the issue of climate, of course, uh, uh, acting as a crisis multiplier in many countries and uh, 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 with, with further destabilization. Uh, so we've also been working very hard in collaboration with our sister institution, um, uh, the bank, uh, to, to really uh, uh, drill down uh, into understanding the impact of uh, climate uh, change on, on, on economies and what, uh, uh, what countries can do to mitigate them. So um, let, me, let me stop there. <laughs> I've gone on for some time, but uh, as such an important uh, subject uh, uh, to drill down into. Thank you very much. Uh, Teresa. Thanks. Thanks so much, Antoinette. And maybe we can we can come back to the the climate piece because you know both you and Axel have mentioned that so far, and I do think that really is key and is so overarching to everything that that we're seeing right now. And something that really struck me while you were speaking as I was thinking about, um, you know, when you were saying we need to build, you know, countries' ability to to prepare for, to foresee the next crisis. And, um, you know, I'm here in Washington, and I was thinking about, you know, the U.S. response to COVID. And we were allegedly the most prepared country, the country in the world that should have been able to do the best at um, preventing the pandemic spread. And we have the world's highest death toll. Almost a million people in this country have died from the pandemic. If, if a country that has all the resources at its disposal, you know, can't find part of it is political will. I mean, other factors as well to, um, you know, to, to act quick, quickly and to have the systems in place. You know, you think about then what an immense challenge it is for a fragile country. If, you know, the United States essentially failed in its pandemic response, we saw so many people die. So that's, um, I was really thinking about that. It really puts things in perspective when you're thinking about, um, you know, the the challenges that we're, we're facing here. Um, I um, want to move on now, bring in our final speaker, um, Joyce. Um, I want to hear from you a little bit more about the development and humanitarian side. Obviously, OCHA works with, um, you know, a number of different actors in your programming uh, on the ground, you know, civil society, big INGOs, UN system, um, other agencies, of course. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how the ongoing pandemic has changed the way development and humanitarian organizations and stakeholders that you are working with both recognize and address the interactions between all these different types of risks that 
we've been talking about in this diversity of settings, um, as we've mentioned, you know, whether it be Ukraine or Afghanistan. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, and good morning, good afternoon, uh, colleagues, and also the participants. Uh, just going straight uh, to your question, Teresa, I think from Ocha's side, the pandemic uh, exposed the interconnectivity of national and international level risks, as well as the interdependence uh, between countries. And what we have seen in OCHA, but also within the larger UN system, uh, actually the pandemic stimulated innovation and sped up the partnership angle uh, within the humanitarian community, but also uh, with development as well as the international financial institutions. So just to give you an example, uh, within OCHA, for example, we have worked very closely uh, with our partners, including local NGOs, to develop the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, which was created through the international global collaboration to ensure that uh, access to COVID diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines is accessible, particularly in humanitarian settings. And out of that, as you know, um, the COVAX initiative also was a component. Um, and within uh, OCHA, we advocated together with our humanitarian partners to not lose focus on the um, fragile and conflict and humanitarian challenges context. So we have been working very closely in um, the humanitarian buffer under the COVAX initiative to ensure that vaccines and doses are actually provided in very challenging humanitarian settings. On the ground, we have been working on the delivery together with our humanitarian partners, international NGOs, as well as the local NGOs in particular. The second point is, as Axel and Antoinette uh, mentioned, the compounded risks pushed us to step back and think about multi-pronged interventions. This tension, but also dynamics between the short-term responses to crisis, what we are seeing now in Ukraine, but also not losing sight of the durable solutions within the humanitarian space for the long-term investments. And uh, that requires a lot of deliberate actions within uh, uh, the UN system, and also focusing the different dimensions of fragility, the gender-based violence, the climate impact in humanitarian settings, and on and on. In reality, what have we done? Again, it goes back to the partnerships angle. Uh, two, uh, we have been working very closely it, together with our partners uh, to strengthen the analytical tools to try and understand the risks both in the long term, but equally important responding to the short term risks. We are also looking at the nuances, for example, of the education loss uh, that has disproportionately affected uh, fragile settings and how, again, we can work and coordinate the larger humanitarian community in response to that. So in summary, um, COVID-19 has taught us that we require both an acute humanitarian response, but also equally important, the long-term investments in development recovery as alluded by other panelists. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you so much for, for that view. Um, I think, you know, again, coming back to this theme of managing the short term while also thinking about the long term. And I think that is is such a challenge and, you know, something we're, we're hearing from our panelists again and again. Um, Joyce, another question for you. Um, what's your experience with how to effectively respond when in context where multiple risks are present at once? And how does this affect the way the humanitarian system is functioning and the way that it interacts with, with development actors and when we see um, the triple nexus? Thanks, Teresa. That's a good and timely question, uh, given what is currently uh, going on. Uh, what we have learned is we need a multilateral and context-specific 
approach that incorporates collaboration, complementarity, as Axel mentioned, between humanitarian and development organizations. And let me give you a specific example, actually, from Afghanistan, where OCHA worked very closely with the World Bank, private uh, IFC, and other humanitarian actors in discussing the unfreezing of financial assets in Afghanistan. So the immediate need was around basic services delivery through the local uh, partners, but the challenge was financing. But by working with the World Bank and IFC advocating for humanitarian carve out and supporting a humanitarian exchange facility as a means to buy local currency from the private sector inside Afghanistan allowed our local partners to actually deliver very basic health, uh, education, and social protection services to communities. So that's one example. I think the other uh, aspect we have learned is the importance of uh, local organizations. Um, you know, uh, the, the advantage, if you like, of the humanitarian community as a whole is the opportunities we have to work with international, but also local uh, um, uh, humanitarian organizations. So that is one area that we are strengthened, but also we are carving out lessons from different contexts to actually help inform uh, the global uh, uh, perspective. And lastly, it's the need to, the, the, uh, we, we've underscored the need for better risk anticipation and prevention within the humanitarian space, uh, within OCHA, learning from other organizations, including the bank and the IMF. Uh, we have the anticipatory action plans, which actually tries to analyze and uh, predict using uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, work, a potential humanitarian crisis. So that way we can plan better. Again, it's this dimension of the short and the long-term need to respond to crisis. Over to you. Yeah, that, that localization piece that you mentioned is quite interesting. That's something we at DevEx have been focusing a lot on recently. And I think Ukraine is such an interesting example of how that's all gonna play out because we are seeing a crisis in an area where many humanitarian organizations had no presence. There were some that were operating in the East uh, with the conflict that's been there since 2014, but many organizations obviously see the need and are coming in to help and are finding out that working with local partners is the most effective way to be helping people at this time when, you know, if you're a big INGO, you don't, you don't have the system in place, you don't have the offices, you don't have the staff, um, obviously quite experienced in emergency response, but uh, it's the local organizations on the ground that really understand the context, know what people need, and, you know, the ability to, to channel assistance through them to really work um, as a humanitarian community, and in particular context, recognize who the best actors are to be doing which particular particular jobs. Um, I think that's um, that's such an interesting point. Uh, Axel, I want to come back to you. Um, and before I do, a quick note for our audience. Um, we'll be taking questions as time allows. So please do um, put any questions you might have in the chat and we will be happy to take them. Um, Axel, I want to talk a little bit more about lessons that we've learned. Um, what lessons can be learned from ongoing responses to COVID-19 and how governments can increase resilience to compound risk in FCV situations? As we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the pandemic is not over. We've learned a lot about the world in the last two years, but we are seeing, you know, a continual amount of crises. Ukraine, of course, an unfortunate example of the last two weeks. And then, you know, climate change, which you've already mentioned as well as, as an ongoing crisis. Well, there are a couple of lessons. Uh, the very first is the sense of urgency. Uh, you need to act fast and with volume. Uh, uh, during crisis to do something small will not solve it. Uh, as the COVID crisis has seen, this is a global challenge. These are huge dimensions. And uh, just, uh, and then uh, let's keep it, but I said it, it, you have to act fast and with volume. So it is nice to have a lot of words and a lot of solidarity, but I think a lot of low-income countries are sick and tired of all the declarations. 
and no real support. I think we need to be real, honest, and support that. And I think we have to lift those things. We have also to, to see that uh, COVID is a good exp example. This is a global public good challenge as climate. So what it will require is coordination and ultimately joint action. So that is where the international community has together. I think it's a special challenge for the multilateral organizations, wherever they are sitting. But the, the test is how we actually bring value added to the table in times of crisis. And we need also to reflect all whether we are fit for the 21st century or are we still thinking in 20th century terms. And I think there are still lessons. I think we need uh, to 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 really reflect on that because I think particularly as it comes to uh, climate change, uh, this is an even greater challenge. So this is needs uh, to be done. I also think uh, that uh, we need to uh, uh, build a resilience. And, and in here, uh, uh, we have good uh, lessons. Uh, I think, again, uh, natural uh, disasters have given us also a lot of good lessons how we are learning, but you need to plan for the long term and, and the pre prevention and preparedness. I think it comes back to this. I think that there has been support, like say for vaccines and deployment, and that is wonderful and it is necessary. We need to act. At the same time, we need to, to take the prevention preparedness agenda uh, even a step further to think about health system strengthening. And that should not be something that is popular for the next couple of months before the next summit or whatever. It needs to be a um, long-term planning. It has almost to be generational. And that means that also for our, our organization, be it for bilateral support, be it for multilateral support, we cannot think of, of a commitment of a couple of years. We need to think of, are you there for the next 10 years, yes or no? And I think that is the question because I think it is too expensive to have something started and then it falters because there are no resources available, the commitments field, and then again, you have a failed uh, uh, initiative. So that is one of the, the challenges we have to think about this. Uh, I, I think, for example, what came out in COVID very prominently is, for example, manufacturing uh, in Africa. Now, that in itself is also, we need to think on how you set this up, not for, for a, a year or so, but how could you that combine that maybe with the efforts of Gavi? And, and, and how can we actually think on, on complementary financing that could also potentially come from IDA or so? I don't know, but it, it seems that we are still in a very compartmentalized world where, it, where this complexity requires also more imaginative. Uh, the last part is money. And whether you like it or not, this is going to cost money. And what I am saying is we need to stay engaged. We, and that engagement cannot go through nice declarations. There is a problem that the OECD countries, while uh, uh, doing a lot of laudable things, it's still not stepping up to the to, to, for, uh, enough to the challenge. This doesn't mean that it should be a it should be a deal with also with the countries, the compact uh, that uh, uh, private sector should be involved. But it should not be uh, misunderstood. We will need also concessional resources, particularly for the poorest countries, and they will need sustained support. The challenge is enormous. And just today, the longer term challenge in the next 10 years, half of the extreme poverty will be concentrated in the fragile states. And, and so it may actually be enlightened uh, self-interest to invest and help these countries have at least a fighting chance, at least a fighting chance to have some chance to actually have a more stable situation and let's let's give them also a chance to have some development and that will need complementary investment so that is where i would always think that also the ngos will be very important we need to advocate that it and it is is not 
a handout. It is basically give the, give countries a chance, and that partnership has to uh, to prosper because this is the only way forward. Thank you. Thanks, Axel, for that that real talk, <laughs> reminding us that. This is going to cost money, right? And I think that's something that inherently, obviously, we all know. But then, um, you know, we can we can all sit around and talk about these problems. But you're correct. Are are the resources actually going to be dedicated to solving them? You know, are we going to put our money really where our mouth says we? You know, identify all these issues. We talk about, um, you know, how challenging it can be in these contexts. What are we actually doing to solve that problem? Um, obviously, money can't solve every problem, but it can solve a lot of problems. Um, you know, when we're we're talking about this um, this particular context. Um, so we're we're going to get to audience questions in a moment, but I've got one more question um, first for Antoinette. You had mentioned the um, new strategy that um, the IMF board had approved in thinking about these issues. Tell us a little bit more about how the new IMF FCF strategy embeds building resilience and supporting FCF countries into itself. Um, no, you know, this is a, a, a good a good way of uh, sort of linking to what uh, Axel was so, uh, has been underscoring about uh, uh, the long-term nature of uh, uh, work with uh, FCS and uh, the need to to really uh, uh, remind ourselves that it it is a long endeavor, uh, and uh, that is certainly one of the uh, uh, the recognition uh, uh, that that our strategy uh, uh, the fact that that our strategy gives recognition to, and in that context we are uh, certainly going to uh, going to uh, first. Um, uh, enhance the tailoring of our engagement to the drivers of fragility. I was speaking about that before, uh, those uh, drivers of fragility and conflict that have a macro critical impact. And all of this in the context of a long-term vision of engagement with, with FCS, because we fully recognize that uh, uh, the issues around fragility will take uh, time, a significant amount of time uh, of, of uh, effective engagement with the international community to be able to address. And in that context, a feature of our engagement, uh, of our new strategy is uh, these uh, country engagement strategies uh, for uh, FCS uh, that will uh, build on the assessments uh, uh, that look at, the, uh, look at these uh, drivers of fragility, political economy, social economic governance, climate security issues, um, and which can be critical bottlenecks for right? effective uh, 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 effectively building resilience. And uh, we'll, uh, of course, these are not areas that the IMF uh, knows a lot about, and uh, this requires uh, deepening our partnerships with uh, those institutions, uh, um, including uh, uh, the bank and, uh, and others, uh, UN agencies uh, that uh, have significant expertise in these areas and partnering with them to leverage uh, the impact of our own work, which is very much focused on macro stability, macro and financial stability, and um, it, you know, uh, second thing we uh, we want to do uh, in in addition to to situating our our, our strategies in this longer term context, recognizing the uh, the sources of fragility, is to really increase our field presence because uh, uh, we need to be closer uh, to uh, our, our member countries, the authorities, and uh, stakeholders to be able to be more effective in supporting them. And uh, uh, our presence on the ground, significantly more presence on the ground should help uh, to, be, uh, uh, to position our work uh, in, a, in a more effective way. Um, a significant part of our field presence will be dedicated to boosting our ability to deliver capacity development through regional, regional technical assistance centers. So uh, uh, we have uh, uh, quite a few of them across, uh, across the world. And uh, yeah, we know that capacity development is critical for, uh, for fragile states. Institution building is one of the biggest challenges. And uh, uh, so this is a, a central focus of our new strategy, uh, making more effective our, our capacity development. It requires greater field presence. So that's uh, another aspect. We're also increasing uh, the, the presence uh, and resources for our res reps as well to help us uh, provide closer support uh, over the longer run and uh, to maintain a continuous dialogue uh, with the uh, country authorities, of course, and partners uh, present on the ground. Um, and uh, that's uh, hugely important for efforts to 
uh, uh, you know, uh, enhance our, our collaborative work with uh, humanitarian and development actors who are so critical uh, uh, in FCS. So uh, this is, um, uh, you know, work that we're, we're, we're very excited to, to be able to, to start uh, uh, rolling out, coming out of our board yesterday with the greater resources that uh, we're allocating to our work on FCS as a huge priority for our institution amidst the, uh, the challenge we'll continue to, to see. And uh, the, the growing, unfortunately, the growing number of FCS we are seeing in, in, in the world we live in today. Thank you. Thanks so much. I um, really interesting to hear um, the the latest on the strategy. Um, one thing that really stood out to me is it sounds like you're really emphasizing relationship building. You know, being there on the ground, being there, um, you know, really observing, speaking with other organizations, partnering with other organizations that are present, taking advantage of expertise. Um, you know, that can be useful to the IMF. Um, but really having those relationships with all of those different players and, you know, really using everyone together to, to try and solve these problems. Um, so that's, that's really interesting to hear about. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience now. Um, again, feel free to continue putting those in the chat. And um, we've got just under 15 minutes left, so we will get to as many um, as we can. Um, the first question, Joyce, is actually for you. Um, uh, you. You mentioned OCHA tools. Could you expand on the types of tools used, especially to keep the private sector engaged and investments not severely impacted during a conflict? Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, and thank you for the question. Um, just um, uh, briefly on the analytical tools, which actually tend to be uh, context specific, uh, the anticipatory uh, analytical tool basically looks at the risks, looks at the data on past trends because of our uh, strong collaboration with local partners we get a lot of data from the local NGOs as well as the international NGOs. And uh, that tool well, is relatively new. I think it's two or three years old and it has been tested. It is being tested in different contexts. Afghanistan is one, we're looking at South Sudan and other places. Um, the second uh, uh, tool, which really is part of the uh, humanitarian response uh, uh, plans. And we can provide more information if the uh, uh, questionnaire has interest. It's more of a strategy. So taking again, the long-term uh, uh, view of the humanitarian interventions, durable solutions, but also looking at the kinds of partnerships that uh, we want to engage with, again, context uh, specific. Third, we are, because of the climate crisis, we, have, we are now looking at the nexus between climate crisis and humanitarian. For example, in South Sudan, some of the humanitarian crises are really driven by um, uh, the climate change impact. So looking at some of the data, the tools that other UN systems, including UNEP has, and trying to come up with a UN, a one UN analytical tool to help inform the humanitarian solutions. And lastly, working with um, uh, very capable and com uh, competent humanitarian partners, ICRC, the Red Cross, uh, and others that have um, a massive uh, presence on the ground, working with local NGOs, but also significant analytical tools that we are trying to learn from. But we can provide more information. Some of this is on the website, but I'll be happy to connect uh, the questionnaire with the relevant entity within OCHA. Over to you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Joyce. Um, the next question I'm going to direct um, towards Axel, but then um, maybe Joyce would also like your, your thoughts on after. Um, so for Axel, the panelists have spoken about the confluence of pandemic, climate, and conflict risks. Some countries also face food insecurity in the midst of all these other risks. Food insecurity tends to be chronic, and as panelists have emphasized the importance of anticipation, how can countries and the international community work more effectively on preventing food crises? I think this is a particularly timely question considering um, you know, the, the conflict in Ukraine and the effect that might have. So Axel, your thoughts. Well, Teresa, let's, uh, because we were talking about compound risk, let's keep in mind that Ukraine feeds 400 million people in the world. That's the equivalent of 
the population almost of the EU. So uh, needless to say, this disruption is going to have effects on many countries, particularly in the Middle East, and will have a, a price effect. But here is the thing. Let's take the example of Afghanistan. So we have been now providing support, uh, the international community, uh, because there, is, there are like 24 million people food insecure. But the problem of this is you cannot keep on only humanitarian uh, support as a strategy. So therefore, we have also been uh, engaging our board to see how can we actually channel some of the support that is in the Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund to provide seed to farmers so that you actually can start producing. So we will be working with the FAO to see how we can actually prepare farmers better for the next farming season. So I think these are the type that we will need to work with, uh, with uh, particularly in agriculture policies to see how we can empower farmers, but also provide the right incentives that they can produce this. So that is uh, an absolute must that needs to be taken into account. And then, of course, what we also need today is that we need to be willing to provide a lot of emergent, uh, emergency support when countries are affected by, for example, locust, what was in the Horn of Africa very bad. So then you, you actually can mitigate this. But you will need to have a combination of, uh, of factors on this. But I would certainly put my finger in the longer term that you ensure that the incentive structure is so that indeed the countries can produce quite a bit themselves. Uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, and, and that actually, uh, we are addressing this because very often this is not being done. And it is not only agricultural policy, it is also looking at irrigation, at least on all the accompanying ma measures that will need to be taken. I think in the short run, my sense is that the uh, Ukraine crisis will worsen further uh, the situation with regard to food insecurity. And uh, it, uh, it reminds you again what we saw, unfortunately, in 2007, 2008. And there will probably be a need for a lot of emergency operations that provides additional financing for particularly vulnerable countries on this. And then we have to look also ahead of the next 12, 24 months, because this crisis is not going to be over. And, and so therefore we can only, uh, cannot look only at the short term. But this is one of the, 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 the concerns. What is a last concern is once food prices increase, let's always keep in mind, there is almost a, a complete correlation with an increase in extreme poverty. So we should not be under any illusions that uh, uh, higher food prices, higher inflations are the worst enemies for the poor. Back to you. Thanks, Axel. Yeah, this is a topic that I, I could talk about forever. I write a lot about food systems, nutrition, agriculture, and I love that you made the point that this really is something that we have to look at the entire food system on, right? You know, from, from seeds in the field, but then also how food is actually getting to people um, and, and all of the, the pieces in between. For any audience members interested, quick shameless plug, um, I write DevX Dish, which is DevX's food systems newsletter. So if you're interested in these topics, would love to have you join us. Um, Joyce, I'd love to hear your thoughts briefly too on that question on um, preventing food insecurity from the, the OCHA perspective. Thanks, uh, Teresa. I think from the OCHA perspective is uh, just reiterating on the importance of the systemic uh, assessment of the drivers, but also solutions for uh, food insecurity. And let me give you a specific example. Uh, uh, we in, in Eastern Africa, for example, when the locust program uh, came into play, uh, Kenya is a big supplier of uh, food products for most countries around uh, East Africa. And what we realized, especially compounded with the COVID uh, pandemic, the supply chain and infrastructure from farm to the cities was completely disrupted. Uh, and then further up north to southern Sudan, the impact of climate crisis was compounding 
the problems on food shortages, which led to uh, increase in food crisis. The way OCHA uh, coordinated as a coordinating humanitarian agencies is actually through collective action. So looking, for example, at UNICEF and focusing on children, FAO, financing, exploring opportunities with international financial institutions, uh, as well as from the policy side, uh, 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 stimulating and encouraging um, uh, policy dialogue between uh, the multilateral development banks as well as the uh, um, uh, countries concerned. So collective action, but also looking at systemic, I like what you say, from farm all the way to fork and looking where the disruptions happens and trying to find the levers of control. Over to you. Thanks so much. Um, we've got just a few minutes left, so I'm going to sneak in one last question um, for, for Antoinette. Um, in countries where um, all, all services are considered essential and government resources are limited, how should governments go about prioritizing what they're spending money on? And if I might add, you know, what role can the IMF play in helping governments decide? Uh, no, a, a very, uh, very good question, uh, Teresa. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it emits, uh, it emits fragility and emits, uh, you know, coming out of conflict or in conflict. Uh, there is a, a sense of, of needing to respond to all needs all at once and, uh, and not having uh, a lot of fiscal space to do so. But I, you know, it, as as real as that uh, as as that sense may be uh, uh, on 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 policymakers at the time, it is our experience that uh, there are uh, uh, some expenditures that could certainly be uh, uh, looked at more closely and uh, uh, seen as perhaps not the highest priority at this particular uh, point in time. So. Uh, in any context, including in FCS context, there there is waste, and uh, there is uh, uh, there are areas uh, uh, to to look at uh, where uh, one can uh, then reallocate the, those savings to the most urgent needs uh, at at the time. Um, there are in many FCS contexts uh, a lot in the way of resources that are wasted through exemptions uh, to uh, uh, you know vested interest. Uh, many of them uh, very uh, politically uh, powerful, of course, and uh, very difficult to address. Uh, uh, pulling back those exemptions uh, uh, and making and making those resources available to spend on education, on health, on um, the critical needs at the time. So, uh, uh, you know, as as real as it may it may seem to some that uh, there are no resources uh, there at all that can be reallocated, uh, uh, repurposed. Uh, it is not. Uh, it is not uh, our experience and, and, and uh, uh, you know, data and information and analysis of all of this definitely shows room for uh, a further prioritization of spending, doing better on the revenue front, uh, difficult as, as it may be. And in those contexts, of course, it's more difficult because the political economy dynamics are especially difficult. Uh, uh, that is to say that, uh, of course, uh, 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 fragile states will also, uh, even when they do have uh, those abilities to reallocate and reprioritize, they do have very large financing needs as well. And this is where the international community has to come in and be uh, supportive in the way of uh, grants and uh, concessional financing and uh, where the funds uh, uh, support uh, when it's needed in the financial context can be catalytic also in mobilizing uh, further support from the donor community. Uh, all with a view to to really making for a, a better use of fiscal space in in fragile states. Thank you. Thanks so Thanks. much, Antoinette. And um, with that, we unfortunately are out of time. Thank you so much to um, the three of you, Joyce, Antoinette, Axel, and of course the former Prime Minister, for being with us this morning. Thanks to you, our audience, for tuning in. We hope you join us uh, for the rest of the day. A little bit of a break before the next session. Um, apologies to those whose questions we couldn't take. Um, we hope to see you throughout the rest of the day engaging on this really important topic. Um, thank you again so much for being with us this morning.